sick of the bickering? We've got the solution. Thoughtful talk about the issues that matter in our community. Fresh Take with Josh Duclo. Be a part of the show by calling 281-1150 or email freshtake1150 at gmail.com. Now, from the Myron Construction Studio, here's Josh Duclo. And welcome back to Fresh Take. So glad that you are with us. And if you've been curious and maybe thinking about trying our video stream and you're sitting at a computer right now, this is the hour to try the video stream. I have something incredibly unique and special for you. I'm gonna guess it's something that has never happened on WHBY before. But before we get to that, I wanna remind you, this hour of Fresh Take is brought to you by Hooper Law Office. You can call Peter Harbach and Sarah Kahn's at 1-800-794-5548. Cooper Law Office, providing a pathway to your legacy. So yeah, like I said, you'll want to get to that video stream. It's available at whby.com or on our Facebook page. We are live streaming video of this hour where we are celebrating Navy Week. Navy Week is happening in Northeast Wisconsin, as you know. It's happening alongside the EAA because the Navy's Blue Angels Flight Demonstration Squad is in town. They're doing some shows at EAA. And as long as their biggest draw was in town, the Navy decided, let's throw a Navy Week. We talked on Monday with Appleton native and Navy Week organizer, Lieutenant David Carter. So if you want to check out the podcast on Monday, you can get a bit more background on Navy Week. But there's events going on all over the region, building interest and awareness in the work that the Navy does. Well, we have something very, very special for you going on. We actually right now, and if you're watching video, you see it. If you're on the radio, beware. We have the Brass Ambassadors, a brass quintet from the Navy band Great Lakes in studio with me right now. Fellas, hello. hello. Hi. Okay, so as you can tell, they're a ways from the microphones because they've got instruments and music stands and things. They are going to be performing in this segment and the next segment songs from their repertoire. We're going to find out how they got started in the Navy and in music and the role that music plays in the Navy. We'll also run down your chances to see the Brass Ambassadors while they are in town this week. Um, we'll go around quickly, introduce each of them, starting with uh, Gregory Lopes. Hi, Greg. And Aaron Deaton. Good morning. And Jason Lucker. Nice to be here. And Ben Leitner. Hi, thanks for having us. And Colin Mose in the corner. Hey, Good Colin. Good morning. <laughs> All right, so uh, the, the talking might be a little different than you're used to, but this is what we needed to do to fit a brass quintet in the studio. Tight quarters, uh, but I'm really excited to see how this is going to go. Before we hear directly from them, I do want to talk a little bit with Greg. So, Greg, why don't we get you up here a little closer to this microphone and um, tell me a little bit about your story, how you got started playing music and then got into the Navy. Sure, yeah. So, uh, I think for me, like, like with a lot of musicians, I didn't really have much of a choice in it. It was something that from a young age, I was drawn to it. Uh, I knew I was bugging my mom at a very, very young age that... When I was in elementary school, uh, I was bugging her from probably second grade that I really wanted to play violin, really wanted to play violin. And I started taking violin lessons in third grade, did that for a couple of years. Uh, and then when fifth grade hit, we, my town that I grew up in didn't have an orchestra. We didn't have an orchestra program. So I wanted to play with all my friends in the band. So the option of, okay, what are you gonna play came up in that weird instrument with the slide thing yes looked really cool yes so i wanted to play that so <laughs> the trombone the trombone uh so i did that and then uh, you know eventually ended up picking up euphonium uh which i felt was my calling i had a band director in high school that was a really fantastic euphonium player and he would play for us sometime and I had never heard anything quite like that. Yeah, for those who aren't aware, the instrument with the slide that Greg referenced is the trombone, and yeah. I played trombone in high school, yeah. so I can agree that that slide seemed very attractive yeah. to like the 11-year-old yeah. me who was having to pick an instrument. Um, euphonium, is it accurate to describe it as kind of a mini tuba? That's perfect, yeah. Okay, yeah. so for those who aren't familiar, right, just imagine the big old tuba you know, just condensed down a little bit. Yeah, and it plays in the same range or octave as the trombone, very similar to trombone, just looks like a mini tuba. That's yeah, perfect. using keys instead of that really cool slide back yeah. and forth. So, uh, Greg, you play euphonium. Um, Aaron is playing trumpet, and Jason is playing trumpet. 
Uh, ben is the lucky guy on the trombone. That's right. And Colin in the corner has the giant tuba on his lap. Um, so he won't be getting too close to microphones, and I understand that that's just fine by him. Um, so, Greg, that's how you got into music. What made you decide to get into the armed forces? Sure. Uh, well, my story might be a little bit different than some of the other guys. Since I'm a euphonium player, um, you know, when I went to college for music, went to college to study euphonium, uh, euphonium is a really unique instrument in that it's one of the only brass instruments that's not in an orchestra. Oh. So for us euphonium players, uh, the military bands are the professional orchestras. They're it for us. Interesting. So yeah. the the instrument choice kind of yeah. defined the professional choices that that would allow. It it did, yeah. It, it, and you know, I love orchestras, and I you know, Ben and I uh, carpool together a lot to work. We live really close. We listen to a lot of orchestral music on our drives into work. I, I love orchestral music, but it, uh, it's just one of those things that the instrument that I play kind of limited that. So I always knew for me that the military band was going to be, a, you know, probably in my future if this was what I was going to do. Uh, and it obviously was. Yeah. It obviously is. Yeah. yeah. It might be worth mentioning here also that the euphonium is not a typical instrument for a traditional brass quintet. That's true. It's usually a That's horn true. player, and, and, and we don't have enough horn players to go around, so he's yeah. uh, substituting on the euphonium. Interesting. Fit this ensemble, and he does a great job. Yes, it's he fantastic. does. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That traditional brass quintet would include a French horn, typically, yeah. uh, in its place. We've got the yeah. euphonium, uh, a little different sound, a little lower register, yeah. um, but fills out the sound of the ensemble nicely. Um, and so, Aaron, you play the trumpet. Uh, right. How did you get involved deciding that you wanted to get and do military service? How did you make that decision? Well, it's a similar story. Oh, different there microphone you go. here. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, gosh, it's, that's. That's a, that's a hard question to condense here in, in <laughs> such a short amount of time, but, uh, well, you know, when it comes down to it, I needed a job, and I graduated with a music degree. What do I do? So military music seemed the obvious choice. Yeah. And I, let me say that I tried some other services, and they couldn't give me a job when I needed it. It was, uh, it was always, well, we, we'll hire you, but uh, you got to wait until we got an opening in, the, in, in next summer at boot camp. You know, yeah. there's all, always these these schedules they go on and I didn't uh, I didn't want to wait <laughs> <laughs> well each branch of the military service has its own music division would that be the word their own yeah, music their own bands, they have their own bands. bands. Yeah. yeah I had a friend from high school that I played with who went into the Marine Corps and played in the Marine Corps band um, and so each branch I know they've got music that works in different ways for their branch of the service we're gonna get into that when we come back after the break but before we take a break I want to do what we're all waiting for and welcome the branch ambassadors to play their first number so we've got microphones throughout the studio we're gonna do our best to bring you the best sound possible um, I can't wait to see how Ben works this slide <laughs> trombone here in the, in the tight quarters um, but Greg before you guys get started what is the number that you guys are going to be playing sure the 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 first piece that we're gonna play for you uh, is a piece named Ashokan farewell uh, Jason, do you have any information on it really quickly? Uh, yes, it's uh, it, this piece was written as the closing uh, piece of music for the Appalachian Music Festival. That it's it's an annual event, so this is the this is traditionally their final piece of music. It's made famous in most people will have heard it in Ken Burns' uh, Civil War series. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so yeah. something that might sound a little familiar to you. Ashikan Farewell. This is the Brass Ambassadors from the Navy Band Great Lakes. Gentlemen, go right ahead. <laughs>
was Ashokan Farewell by the Brass Ambassadors from the Navy Band Great Lakes. It's the Brass Quintet of the Navy Band Great Lakes. That's Greg Lopes, Aaron Deaton, Jason Lucker, Ben Leitner, and Colin Mose. They'll be with us after this break. We'll hear more from them about the role music plays in the Navy. And one more song before we let them out of here. Don't go away. Lots more to come. It's Navy Week in Northeast Wisconsin and today on Fresh Take. You're listening to WHBY. And with me in the Myron Construction Studio today is the Brass Ambassadors, the Brass Quintet that is part of the Navy Band Great Lakes. You heard them before the break. We've got one more number for them to perform. Before we do, though, uh, Greg, tell us a little bit about Navy Band. How many bands are there in the Navy, and what function do they perform? Sure, yeah. So we have... Uh, 11 official Navy bands. Uh, nine of those bands are fleet bands, um, which is what we are. Uh, so Navy Band Great Lakes, for example, is stationed just outside of, outside of Chicago, in, in North Chicago, a little north of the city. Um, and we have bands stationed throughout the country and, and you know, several uh, areas where there are Navy bases, obviously. And then we have three bands that we consider uh, OCONUS, or overseas, uh, which Hawaii technically is considered overseas for us. And then we have a band in Japan and in Italy. Oh, wow. So bands all over the world. Do musicians typically switch between bands, or once you get in one band, you kind of stick with it for your career? Sure, yeah. So we uh, rotate, uh, or PCS as the military calls it, just like everyone else does, usually, you know, every two, three, four years, oh, depending sure. on, you know, what, what, the, what the needs of the Navy are yeah. at, that, at that time. Have any of you been stationed in the, any of the overseas bands? Yeah? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what's that experience like? Uh, being, uh, I was previously stationed in the band in Japan. Uh, it's, it's, it's a completely different experience than here. Here in, in the States, our, our, our purpose is primarily ceremonial support, and then we will also do some public performances and outreach performances like this one today. In Japan, the, the primary performances that we do pr pretty much serve diplomatic purposes. So we are there to support the existence of uh, the American military overseas and, and to help serve, like I said, uh, 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 excuse me, diplomatic purposes. Sure. And, and that actually has, has um, long-reaching uh, effects. Uh, sometimes, for instance, the, the first, first military presence in Vietnam after we left the conflict in mm -hmm. the 70s was a military band. They, they opened up diplomatic communications by sending in the band first okay. and then when they we softened them by we I don't mean me this right, was a right. while ago <laughs> but um, we softened up the, yeah. the the feelings and then we were able to send in sure. more more, more military. Yeah, right, questions. to follow that up with additional diplomatic resources, yes. other things like that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so there are chances for you to see these guys perform. They're going to have one more song for you. Um, they'll get ready to perform that one. I want to let you know they played last night with the Appleton City Band, but tonight they'll be playing with the Green Bay City Band at St. James Park at 7.30 p.m. Thursday they'll be playing at the Oshkosh Public Library at 6.30 at Schwabenon's Klipstein Park at 7, and Friday at 9 a.m. at the Green Bay Children's Museum. And Greg, it's not all you guys. It's not just your quintet. There's other smaller ensembles of the band that are doing these performances around the community, right? Yeah, that's correct. So within the larger Navy band Great Lakes, we have small ensembles just like us. We have a brass quintet, which is us. We have a woodwind trio, which is three woodwind players. We have a rock band, or we call it a popular music group, and they do all the hits. Um, but all of them are really fantastic and very much worth your time. I would, I would recommend going to see you. Awesome. Well, I'll run down that list again, but let's get to the next song. Um, tell us about it, Greg. What are you going to play for us? Sure. So we wouldn't be a military band if we didn't play a march, yes. right? Uh, so uh, we're going to play an arrangement of a march by uh, not John Philip Sousa, uh, a slightly less well-known but still very prominent composer named Henry Fillmore. Uh, and this march is called Americans We because we are all Americans. Fantastic. This is the Brass Ambassadors from the Navy Band Great Lakes playing Americans We. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Americans We by the Brass Ambassadors from the Navy Band Great Lakes. That is Greg Lopes, Aaron Deaton, Jason Lucker, Ben Leitner, and Colin Mose. Gentlemen, thank you so much, not only for your performance here today, but for your service to our country and for defending our freedom. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having us. When we come back, we will have Command Master Chief David Robinson, the head officer of the USS Green Bay, with us. He'll tell us about life on the ship and about what his sailors have been doing this week during Navy Week here in Northeast Wisconsin. Back with more on Fresh Take right after this on WHBY. This hour of Fresh Take is brought to you by Hooper Law Office. Find them in Appleton, Green Bay, or Oshkosh, or find them online at hooperlawoffice.com. Hooper Law, providing a pathway to your legacy. Well, that was fantastic to hear from the Brass Ambassadors, the Brass Quintet that's part of Navy Band Great Lakes. If you missed that part of the show, you're going to want to go, yeah, the podcast will be fine. You'll hear them. They sounded awesome. Go check out the video. We're live streaming video of this hour at whby.com and on our Facebook page. You can get those videos. They'll be stored there forever on our website. You can check out the performance of the Brass Ambassadors. Now joining me in the Myron Construction Studio is Command Master Chief David Robinson. He is the Senior Enlisted Officer on the USS Green Bay. Master Chief Robinson, welcome to Fresh Take. Thank you for having me. So glad to have you here appreciating all the presence of the Navy here for Navy Week in Northeast Wisconsin. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Blue Angels, that flight demonstration squad, probably what everyone's familiar with from the Navy, those Blue Angels will be flying as part of EAA. And before we get started, I do want to remind everybody, you'll have a chance to see ensembles from the Navy Band Great Lakes tonight when they play with the Green Bay City Band at 7.30 in St. James Park, Thursday at the Oshkosh Public Library at 6.30, at Ashwabanon's Klipstein Park at 7, and then Friday morning at 9 a.m. at the Green Bay Children's Museum. So plenty of opportunities to see the Navy Band for yourself. Uh, but Master Chief Robinson, you're not a musician. You oversee work and life on the USS Green Bay. Before we get to that, is this your first visit to Green Bay? Yes, it is my first visit. I'm having a ball here. Everybody's so nice and, and warm and welcoming. I'm glad to be here. I am glad to hear that. Where do you call home when you're not on deployment? Uh, Sasebo, Japan is a home port for uh, USS Green Bay, so we've been there uh, a couple years now. Okay, and uh, where did you grow up here in the States? Well, Tampa, Florida, our hometown. Okay, great. So um, exploring some of the North Woods here as far as that goes. And yes, I am. Some Midwestern hospitality. Yes, 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 and the weather is great. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, we have I'm enjoying weather. it. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, if you've got questions for Master Chief Robinson, about what his role is like on the USS Green Bay or what life is like there, give us a call. 281-1150 is the number, or email me, freshtake1150 at gmail.com. Now, uh, the reason that you're here, Master Chief Robinson, is because you are the senior enlisted officer on the USS Green Bay. And as part of Navy Week, 
there is an effort by the Navy to build a connection between the sailors on the ship named for Green Bay and the community in and around Green Bay. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing here to help build some of those connections. Well, uh, uh, we've, we've had an opportunity to serve it uh, and talk to the Boy Scouts, girl, uh, Boys and Girl Scouts. We had an event at Habitat for Humanity, and we're currently working with the uh, St. Vincent uh, Thrift Store, uh, helping out and, and just doing what we can uh, to be a part of the community. So doing some volunteer work Absolutely. while you're here. Absolutely. Loving it. Groups. That's fantastic. Is there an interest, and maybe this is more of a second-level interest, in sort of int introducing young people to possible careers in the Navy? Yes. One of the, one of the main things we like to show as a, a Navy force is, is not just about life on board a ship, uh, fighting in the desert, but it's, it's serving our local community, uh, showing them what we represent, and that's being uh, a, a good servant uh, to mankind. Yeah, that's fantastic. That service ethic goes beyond military Absolutely. service to community service Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. That's fantastic to hear. So tell us a little bit about what life is like on the USS Green Bay. You told us you're, you're stationed in Japan, uh, so that's sort of home base yes. while you're on the ship. Uh, what's life like there on, 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 on the ship? I tell you, being on board Green Bay is, is similar to like walking around in the city of Green Bay. My first visit has been, like I said, warm and welcoming, and that's the kind of uh, atmosphere we like to create, that warm and welcoming type teamwork, uh, team building atmosphere. Uh, so we, we have about a thousand sailors and marines uh, on board now. We're currently deployed, uh, so we've been deployed for a couple months now. Uh, but uh, life on board is grand. Uh, and you won't believe our flight deck is actually named uh, Lambeau Field. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a ship named for Green Bay, there had to be something Absolutely. named for Lambeau Field. Absolutely. I love that. Well, true to the nature then of the Green Bay, you can represent the Packers with uh, the flight deck Lambeau Field. <laughs> A thousand soldiers, sailors on the ship there with you. It's almost like taking a small Wisconsin town and putting it on a, on a big giant boat. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. And each sailor has their own unique role within the, the, the team on the ship. Is that how that works? Yes. Yeah, so the, the ship is built and uh, every, every sailor on board or marine on board have specialties that they, they specialize in, whether it's cooking or whether it's engineering or whether it's help launching the helicopters or whether it's working with computers, you name it, there's a support system in place or, or a sailor or marine that's been schooled properly to educate any type of gear to make us be able to run out to sea and do what we need to do. Sure. My grandfather was actually a chef in the Navy, so he was a cook. Oh, really? Yeah. What? You won't believe this. I was a cook. You were? I was. I mean, they say an army travels on their stomach, right? So <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You need to have good food. Absolutely. People need to be properly fueled in order to do their work. Absolutely. Now, you said that. Now, that's one of my main responsibilities is to make sure that the entire man is, and woman uh, is taken care of. They're all their needs is met, whether it's safety, morale, uh, good order and discipline, all those things. That's my sole purpose is to make sure they're taken care of. You're, uh, you're watching out for every one of those thousand sailors and Marines that Absolutely. are on that ship with you. Absolutely, yes. And so day to day, tell us a little bit about what it's like being a Command Master Chief, which, by the way, I know you probably didn't come up with that title, but that is a great title, <laughs> Command <laughs> Master Chief. But in that role, you told us you're responsible for morale and health and safety. What does a typical day look like? Are you more like a, a high school principal? Are you more like a daycare instructor? Whoa, whoa. What, what is your day-to-day -day like? What kind of things are you doing? Well, uh, my captain, uh, uh, Captain Nate Moyer, uh, we, we start off in the morning and uh, with my executive officer, uh, Tom Schultz, Captain Tom Schultz. So we start off and we have our morning talks and we talk about what, what we're expecting for today. And we go through day events and we make sure, as I said, the sailors are taken care of and as well as families. So if there's family issues, we want to, I make sure that they're taken care of as well. Mm -hmm. So when you're on the ship, you are deployed. That'd be the way of talking about that. You're out doing some kind of mission. What kind of missions does the USS Green Bay get deployed on? What kind of things are you asked to do on behalf of the Navy? So uh, being uh, deployed, we're, we're what you call a forward deployed asset. So we're uh, forward deployed and we're at the president's call. Uh, when he need a ready uh, asset, we're actually America's 911 LPD. That's what Green Bay is. We're, we don't have to be combat ready, we're ready. 
we're ready. We don't have to get ready. We're ready for the fight. Yeah. Uh, most recently, we just completed an exercise, Talisman Saber, uh, working with our uh, Royal Australian Navy and the Royal uh, uh, New Zealand Navy, and we just concluded a great exercise with them. Interesting. And so as in our domestic politics here, we're hearing more and more about the conflict potential on the Korean Peninsula. Given that you're positioned there in Japan, you would potentially be one of those first enacted or um, deployed assets if conflict were to erupt there. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what we train for. And we're always ready. Wow. We train and ready for the fight. It's interesting. And I think perhaps our listeners will have even more of an interest in watching events in that corner of the world now, knowing our namesake ship and the thousand sailors and, uh, and you, Master Chief Robinson, are there on board at the tip of the spear, at the front line there uh, keeping us safe. Even, yeah, even more so. It's, it's more important that, you know, uh, that same concept that we like to see that the Packers, uh, the community get behind the Packers. We would love that same uh, support for them to get behind USS Green Bay. Oh, I love it. Well, the appearance you're doing this week as part of Navy Week is certainly going to help to build some of that following. We do have a caller here who has a question. Uh, Ken is on the line with a question about Navy SEALs. Ken, what's on your mind? Uh, good morning, guys. Um, sir, thank you for you and all your crew for your service. Um, we, uh, as all Packer fans, appreciate very much uh, the, uh, the things you have to go through to uh, protect our country. And my question is, um, are there any uh, Navy SEALs on board, or is that something you can't, uh, you know, talk about? Sure, we could talk about it, uh, but we don't currently have them. Uh, if if a, a need arise, yeah, sure, we would bring them on board, but they're not permanently attached to USS Green Bay. Uh, the only assets attached to Green Bay are uh, regular active duty sailors and uh, Marines. And we have about 400 sailors and then about 700 or so Marines that we bring on board. Okay, well, thank you very much. And again, thank you for your service. Yes, sir. And thank you so much for the phone call, Ken. Uh, last thing with you, uh, Master Chief Robinson. <laughs> Too many titles there. Master Chief <laughs> Robinson. Um, we don't have to get into the politics of it, but just today, President Trump announced that he wants to change the composition of the military, prohibiting transgender Americans from serving. I want to ask you, in your service, overseeing a thousand people on a ship, what is the importance of morale and cohesion for your unit, and what contributes to or detracts from, in your experience, the proper functioning and highest performance of your team? I tell you, all we need is a sailor to come to work or a Marine to come to work. What they do on their own time, that's their own time. I just need an able body that I can train for the fight. That's all we need. Somebody who feels that commitment to Absolutely. serve the country and, and is there at your disposal to yes. do what they're told, right? Absolutely. Well, it's important that the missions that come down from on high are fulfilled to the highest potential. Uh, great folks like Command Master Chief David Robinson here with me, Senior Enlisted Officer on the USS Green Bay. He is leading the force, a thousand sailors and Marines strong on the USS Green Bay. They're here all over town, and uh, you've got chances uh, to interact with them, events that they've been doing at the Boys and Girls Club, uh, other places throughout the community, volunteering, including at St. Vincent de Paul uh, today here in the Fox Valley. Master Chief Robinson, thank you so much for making time to join us here today on Fresh Take, and uh, thank you for your service. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, that'll do it for our Navy Week coverage today on Fresh Take. When we come back, we'll recap the Senate health care progress, if you want to call it that, question mark, and uh, other things in politics that have happened just since we've come on the air today, one of which we just mentioned. We'll come back and wrap up the politics beat before we wrap up Fresh Take today on WHBY. And welcome back to Fresh Take. I'm your host, Josh Duclo. It is 1050 here at the Myron Construction Studio of WHBY. Celebrating Navy Week, we had Command Master Chief David Robinson, the senior enlisted officer on the USS Green Bay. He's leading some of his sailors in some volunteer work in the community here this week. 
Of course, the Blue Angels Flight Demonstration Squad will be putting on performances at the EAA, and we had the Brass Ambassadors from the Navy Band Great Lakes playing in studio this morning. If you want to catch them, you can see them tonight playing with the Green Bay City Band at 7.30 at St. James Park, at, on Thursday at the Oshkosh Public Library at 6.30 p.m., or on Thursday at the Ashwaubenon Klipstein Park at 7, and then on Friday at 9 a.m., an ensemble of the band will be playing at Green Bay Children's Museum. So lots of opportunities to see different ensembles from Navy Band Great Lakes, and uh, really, really grateful to all the folks, Lieutenant David Carter, uh, Lori Frechette from Red Shoes PR, uh, Command Master Chief David Robinson, and the guys in Brass Ambassadors, Greg Lopes, Aaron Deaton, Jason Lucker, Ben Leitner, and Colin Mose, all of whom made this coverage possible. Grateful to them. And if you missed any of it, you can go check out the video stream on our Facebook page. It'll be there once the stream shuts down or on whby.com. Loading lots of great video there on the site for you all kinds of things that you can see what's happening here in the studio. To wrap up the hour today and the show today, I want to touch on what happened with healthcare. But what I'm realizing is the healthcare thing is kind of grinding on. If you've got thoughts on what happened yesterday with healthcare, what's going to happen today in the Senate with healthcare, I welcome your phone calls or your emails. The number is, you know, 281-1150 or email freshtake1150 at gmail.com. Uh, an opportunity there to weigh in on that subject, but literally while we have been on the air today, a brand new story has been developing out of Washington. Uh, I'm going to read you, as I said before, when Troy called, I don't put much weight in Donald Trump's tweets, um, except sometimes he uses his Twitter account to make official announcements. Uh, and so I'm going to read you three tweets that came out this morning. Donald Trump tweeting on his personal account, quote, after consultation with my generals and military experts, Please be advised that the United States government will not accept or allow, second tweet, transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. Our military must be focused on decisive and overwhelming, third tweet, victory, and cannot be burdened with the tremendous medical costs and disruption that transgender in the military would entail. Thank you. Uh, so a bit more official sounding than the typical Trump tweet, uh, making it official, uh, apparently as of immediately, that the United States government, I think he means military, will no longer accept transgender Americans into service in the U.S. military. Uh, reading from the Washington Post story says that this is a reversal of the Obama administration decision that would have allowed transgender Americans to serve. Uh, he announced this, of course, on Twitter today citing the need to focus on victory and the burden of medical costs and the tremendous, quote, disruption that transgender troops would create. Um, I don't know what you think about this. I, I am just utterly dumbfounded by this. And obviously the president, the commander in chief, he is the final say when it comes to military forces. He is the commander of all military forces. And his word goes. And when President Obama was in office, he was able to change policy in the direction that suited his desires and needs. And Donald Trump doing the exact same thing. That's what presidents get to do. The reason I'm dumbfounded is because during the campaign, I distinctly remember Donald Trump making the case that he would better represent LGBTQ Americans. That's lesbians and gays and bisexuals and transgender Americans. Better, he said, than Hillary Clinton would. Uh, I don't think this does that, although I suppose this is where his priorities start to come into conflict with each other. If he believes that transgender soldiers would be a disruption and a costly medical burden, then that might get in the way of his priority of America first and restoring America's strength on the world stage. So I guess I understand it to the extent that there's logic behind this. I guess I understand it, but I'd love to know what you think about this. Uh, send me an email, freshtake1150 at gmail.com, or tweet at me, at Josh Duclo. We've got a couple minutes to take your phone call if you're ready right now. Zach, what do you think about this? I know this is just breaking just this morning, but thoughts or reactions? I guess there needs to be more information about what was the reasoning. We hear disruption, but we don't know what the disruption is. I mean, we have no idea if they were just overreacting. Was there a reason for this? Uh, you have to believe the fact that he talked to his military experts, talked right. to some generals. I don't know. If there's a reason, I would think you need to let that 
be known publicly, maybe find out why this came out of nowhere. Yeah. Or we always talked about this. Is this a distraction for what's going on in the Senate? That's exactly where I was going next. That's exactly where I was going next, Zach, is I wonder, given how the health care vote in the Senate is kind of falling apart, is this just a way to change the subject? Because we've got cable news on in the studio right now, and they're talking about Trump. But they're talking about health care and they're talking about this transgender soldier ban and they're talking about other tweets. So it, it's just putting more into the conversation, into the cable news bloodstream. And if he thought that the coverage of the health care debate and vote and failure of progress on repeal and replace was looking bad for him, maybe this was a way to regain some upper hand in the national debate. And that's why it's so hard to cover step by step of everything that's coming out through President Trump's Twitter account, news breaking out, news leaks, because you have three things going on, as you mentioned. You have the health care, you have this, and don't forget the whole Jeff Sessions situation that's still a brewing right now. Yeah, yeah, well, and that's a great point. Is th That's another thing they're talking about on cable news is the, is the controversy around Jeff Sessions, the early supporter of Donald Trump, the man appointed to be Donald Trump's attorney general, uh, who Donald Trump has been referring to in tweets as beleaguered, and very weak this week. Uh, I heard some talking heads, they were thinking maybe what, what Donald Trump is trying to do here is to force Jeff Sessions' hand, to get him to quit, because firing him would look bad in the context of firing Comey, of the speculation about potentially firing Robert Mueller, that if he then goes and fires his AG as well, that this just feeds into that narrative about obstruction of justice and disrupting what is supposed to be an independent judiciary and law enforcement investigation of Russian influence in the 2016 elections. Now, if that investigation headed by Robert Mueller leads in directions that head back to Trump family finances and relationships with Russia, that could be not good for the president. And we heard him say that would be out of bounds and out of line. If he goes in that direction, I wouldn't be surprised to see Donald Trump fire Robert Mueller because we've seen that kind of action from a president before. However, that was the action we saw from President Nixon right before the hammer started to drop and he finally decided to resign. I know it's still really early in Trump's first term. We are just six months in. But it feels like we've had a couple of years of this presidency already. And it kind of feels like we're approaching the beginning of some kind of end game. I got to say, I could be totally wrong. I've been wrong on lots of things in the past. But it does feel like we're reaching a point where Republicans are starting to pull away. These are the sort of things that are going to for force them to make a choice. Three more years. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right, Zach. You're probably right. And that's what I tell people who are talking about impeachment. I say, focus on 2020. That's the end game. All right, that'll do it for me today. Thanks for being with us. Great show coming for you again tomorrow, including our own Mike Ellis for just an abbreviated visit. But you won't want to miss it. We'll see you.